Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, the government have made the same mistake over and over again. Back in March, they entered a lockdown too late in a self-defeating bid to protect the economy. And most recently, they made the bizarre decision to loosen a lockdown four weeks before a Christmas free-for-all. In between those two fateful decisions was another disastrous mistake. Back in September, when the government should have been closing down the rest of the economy so that students could safely go back to school, they instead, in hock with their friends in the press, were actively trying to bully people back into their workplaces. Aaron and I discussed this at the time, and what you'll notice is another theme which has been present throughout this crisis. When the Tories have made poor decisions, it's usually because they're prioritising defending the interests of their wealthy mates. After almost six months of the majority of Britain's young people remaining out of schools, this week they have finally returned. That's a good thing, and we should still be backing wholeheartedly the union's campaign to make sure that that goes as safely as possible, that the resources are provided to teachers and schools um, so that we don't see another coronavirus spike because, because kids have gone back. But ultimately, six months out of mainstream education for most kids was, was not a good thing. It was, a, it was regrettable. Um, but, and, it, and it seems like at this point in time, the unions and the government both seem to be somewhat agreed that they have to go back now. So, so the, the framing of the debate is now how safe is it going to be when they're back? And that is really what we should all be discussing. What the, what the political class should be debating on television and on the front pages of the newspapers are how are we going to make sure that this incredibly necessary thing, which is that kids go back to receive the education that they need, goes, pu- goes by without creating you know, an appalling second spike. But that is not how they are greeting this moment. That is not their focus as kids go back into their classrooms. No, instead what they are using is this opportunity as one to blackmail workers back into their offices. So we're going to go to a Daily Mail front page from this morning. Um, So they write, they're back at work. Where is the rest of the UK? So they're saying, if the kids have gone back, then why haven't the adults gone back? If the kids are brave enough to go back to school, why can't the adults you know, suck it up and go into their offices. And the reason this is a terrible argument is, is one, why would you force anyone to, to go back into their offices if they don't need to, if it's an unnecessary risk? But also, they've completely misunderstood the relationship between kids going back to school and workers going back into their offices. Because quite, you know, in contrast, in, in direct contradiction to the idea that because kids have gone back, workers should go back. In fact, no, it's because kids have gone back, workers should not go back. Because as we've been told over the last six months, completely correctly, this idea of the reproduction rate of coronavirus, the R rate, that goes above one if we do too many things at the same time. So if we want to make sure that our kids, as is necessary, can go back to school without causing a second spike, what we have to do is make sure that all the unnecessary things we stop doing. So what we should be saying is so that our kids can safely go back to school and so they can safely stay in school, if you can continue working from home, do it. But that's not what they're saying. Um, And they're not saying that purely because they want to back up the interests of commercial landlords and in some cases, their own business models. So I want to go to um, another headline now. Um, which is from the Evening Standard. So this is edited by former Chancellor George Osborne, owned by Russian billionaire and now Lord Evgeny Lebedev. Um, and they went with a very similar headline to the Mail. Um, but they also had this, this comment. Today, a new London should begin. Careful to contain COVID, but ready to return. It's up to each one of us. The magic which makes London is in terrible danger. A ghost city is no city at all. And you read that say, Oh, this is about the general good of London. What we want is people to go back to work so that the remarkable energy that makes London great can be re-brought about, can be, can be made live again. Now, uh, that's bullshit because if people, if people wanted London to go back to the way that it was before, they would be going back to work right now. But what you have realized now is that one, people value their health more than you know, <laughs> going into their offices and making sure that prep can continue operating at a profit and that potentially people getting up uh, at 6 a.m getting on a packed tube going to work spending a bunch of their wages on on lunch was not quite as magical as George Osborne and Evgeny Lebedev might have believed but why would they want you to go straight back because in the economy where people you know have a work-life balance maybe they work for three days at home two days in the office what aren't they reading so often the evening standard who's advertising revenue fools Lebedev's 
the Russian billionaire who's now a lord. So we have our media class who are supposed to be informing us about how this country can best contend with coronavirus, who instead are putting their petty interests of short-term profit ahead, the public, ahead of the public good and calling it news. You know, you, you couldn't make it up. Um, this is, I suppose, the more obvious argument put forward, which is, you know, ridiculous. Um, the more subtle argument as to why people need to go back into their workplaces other than to relight the magic of London is to save jobs. This was an argument made by ex-Tory health minister Jeremy Hunt this morning on the Kay Burley show. Let's take a look. Do you think that the government did too good a job when it comes to lockdown in that people thought, if I stay at home, I'll live, if I go out, I'll die, and now they don't want to send their kids back to school? Well, I think what we have in this country is a very sophisticated, educated electorate who understand health issues very well. And when the instructions were clear, and they were very, very clear about staying at home, people complied. Um, but we're also very inventive and creative, and I think a lot of people found that it was much easier to work from home than they perhaps thought it would be. And so that's why it's proving a bit more of a struggle to get people to go back to work, because um, people obviously find it's a lot more productive if uh, they're not having to commute. But as Therese Coffey was saying earlier on your show, the big problem is all those jobs in city centres that depend on people going back to work. I think there's also someone who ran their own business for many years. Uh, there's a creativity you get, a buzz in an office, which you don't get when you're doing meetings over Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams. And there's only so long that you can carry on working completely remotely before you start losing the kind of fizz and excitement that you get in a really good workplace. So I think people will want to go back to work eventually. I hope it happens soon. So obviously the, the headline line from that interview was Jeremy Hunt saying that people want to go back into the office for the excitement and fizzle. Um, and, you know, the obvious response being, has there ever been anyone who looks like they suck more excitement and fizzle out of a room than Jeremy Hunt? Someone who looks permanently constipated and struggles to smile. I mean, we, we don't actually have to speculate as well because um, it just so happens that before Jeremy Hunt was an MP, he was co-founder and co-director of the company Hot course. Um, and one of his employees there was Luke Turner, now an editor at the music magazine The Quietus. Um, Turner worked as an admin at the organization and had this to say about the firm. What made it the worst three years of my life was the working environment and the expectation put onto the staff by Hunt and other managers. When a deadline approached, we were expected to work late into the night for no overtime or recompense. Rarely we were thanked for our labours. There was a general air that we should be grateful for the remarkable opportunity that this endless admin offered. There was certainly a different attitude towards employees who'd been to private school or Oxbridge than to the rest of us. In such a high-pressure environment, yet producing such mundane work, stress levels rose. I know of good friends and colleagues who suffered near-nervous breakdowns from the experience of working in such a vampiric, morale and confidence-sapping operation. Everything was secondary to the operation of the business. So that was written back in 2012 about working in an office under the management of Jeremy Hunt. He's now on the television saying people should go back to work because of the excitement and the fizz. I mean, have you ever been to a place which has got less excitement and fizz than the average open plan office? Mm. Right? Actually, there's, there's a wealth of literature about this where if we were to actively design places where people were constantly distracted, unable to be productive, unable to concentrate, unable to do what Cal Newport, an academic who specializes on precisely this topic, calls deep work, uh, we, we would have the open office, uh, open plan office. And what this is all about, and this is really important. Again, this is not about capitalism wants us to go back to the office. Many firms would actually love to get rid of their office full time. You hear, I'm hearing this repeatedly, actually, from friends who work in businesses and they're saying remote working works great. We're not going to renew the lease. That's happening a lot. And to keep them competitive, to save money, they're very happy to outsource office costs to their staff, right? That's not a progressive thing, by the way. But they're happy to do it. This is not about maximizing the interests of business even. This is about maximizing the interests of rentiers, people who own the office blocks, the landlords. And this is an important fracture within British capitalism about where is value being not created, captured. And it's not by uh, enterprises that you know, are creating 
sort of new goods and services, overwhelmingly it's by the rentier class, by the landlord class. Really important point. So this idea of us all going back to work, yes, okay, it would get pret off life support, but the people it would serve the most are the landlord class. Oh, we're going we're gonna to reveal something about Jeremy Hunt's relationship to the landlord class in one moment. First of all, I want to go back to that jobs point because it is going to be the politically most relevant argument which is made, which is to, I suppose, essentially guilt people, blackmail people, say you have to go back to work. Otherwise, these people, potentially on lower incomes than yourselves, will lose their jobs. Um, the obvious sort of example here, what's going to become, I suppose, the, the, the archetype of the job that will be lost if people do not go back to their offices in the same numbers as before, is the person working at Pret. But then we have to ask, are those jobs really worth saving? And that does not mean should, these, should the people who, who are in those jobs, if they lose their jobs, they obviously have to be fundamentally supported. We need retraining system. We need a green industrial revolution. That means that jobs come about that people actually want to do and which actually add value. Um, but uh, do, we, do we want to encourage the public to risk their health to risk the R rate rising above one and schools having to close just to save the Pret economy. Now, there was a great article um, in the FT by Sarah O'Connor. This is not a socialist publication who was saying, no, we don't want to save the Pret economy. So the article's headlined, goodbye to the Pret economy and good luck to whatever replaces it. Cities will not die. Their benefits could become more diffuse with well-paid workers spreading into the rest of the country. I recommend reading it. Great piece. So she writes, high housing costs were particularly problematic for the low-paid workers who made the cities run. Increasingly, only migrants seemed willing to accept low-wage jobs, cleaning offices or making coffee. In 2017, Pratt's Director of Human Resources told Parliament that just one in 50 of its job applicants was British. Later that year, the Financial Times interviewed a Pratt worker from Romania who woke at 3 a.m. to commute an hour and a half from East Ham to the branch in Waterloo. She was paid £16,000 a year. Now, obviously, there were some people that will use that, that argument that one in 50 people who are applying for it are British in a sort of xenophobic way. That's why we need Brexit, so that we have British people serving British sandwiches. But obviously, the implication there is not that too many foreign people are applying for jobs at Pret. It's that the conditions are so low that people you know, with higher expectations about what they should be earning because they were brought up in this country won't work there because they're not willing to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning, commute two hours to work for 16 grand a, a year and probably pay about half of that to again a rentier so this is you know this is not the best we can do when someone says the alternative to us going back to the, the status quo as it was before is mass unemployment you know call their bluff the alternative to us going back to how things were before is we have a government that takes the responsibility to bring about an economy that actually works for ordinary people not pays them shit wages to have fundamentally a miserable life doing things that they don't particularly value and you know ultimately paying half of it to rentier aaron how do we win this argument that mm. we don't want to go back to the economy as usual we want jobs but we want them to be better than they were before yeah it's an important question i think one of the incredibly predictable responses you get from this is well actually rentiers are really important because pension funds are tied into the rent economy and if we get defaults from commercial rents then you know, that little old lady, her private pension, it won't be paid, right? This isn't true. Pensions, okay, are indexed. They invest in a bunch of companies. They spread the risk, okay? So for every commercial property company that's going to collapse, and yes, the returns won't come from that, there are also investments in Zoom or hand soap dispensers, right? So firstly, that argument isn't, isn't remotely correct. Secondly, we need to have a conversation about a four-day working week, I think. This is the best way right now to manage everything in the medium term. You don't even need to necessarily, it's a long-term measure. You say, we're gonna move to a four-day week. We're gonna have the state top up people's wages, carry on furlough effectively, I think, for a significant parts of the economy, uh, and perhaps muck about with you know tax brackets, tax bans, and so on. Have something resembling a UBI, not a UBI, something resembling a UBI, a really good threshold for, for people basically to to have, so you, 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 you can make ends meet on about three days work a week, which presently for much of the country, particularly London, isn't true. Secondly, this is gonna have a really big impact on London, huge impact on London. Uh, we don't really know how much. Right now, property prices are still high. Rents are actually falling. Hackney's rents are falling because Airbnb, the Airbnb economy, just like Pratt, you know, it's really suffering. There's a huge increase of supply for properties, all these, 
these uh, flats that were going to be let, let you know rented on airbnb for two days three days one week two weeks all of a sudden they're saying well look actually let's just get a secure tenant in there for six months much more secure we'll get our money so that means that uh, rents are rents are falling now the question for a young person is this and i don't know the answer if you were 18 or 19 michael would you start university this year i wouldn't i certainly wouldn't move to a city to then do my lectures online if you're a recent graduate would you live in a large city like london and try you know try and make that break i don't think i would and so i think you know the longer this crisis goes on i think we're going to have a really big break with the kind of status quo common sense that we've had for the last 20 30 years which is if you want to get ahead you have to go to major metropolitan areas particularly london now right now there's not an alternative right if you're a young person you want to get ahead well okay what else do you do that's you know that's a 64 million dollar question but it's not going to be uh, the, the the previous kind of status quo ante which is go to london get an internship get your foot on the ladder nobody's going to be saying that for potentially two three years that's a huge rupture for a generation of young people entering the labor market and ultimately what this is about is giving people more options because obviously you know i want anyone who wants to move to london and go to university to be able to do that but the idea you should have to move to a mega city to get up in the career ladder and in the process spend half of your income on on rent is is ridiculous I want to take us back to Hunt briefly because, as we've mentioned, one of the main people who are going to lose out if people don't go back to their office spaces in the same numbers as they had before is commercial landlords. Because what many businesses are, are realizing, as Aaron has mentioned, is that they can save money on, on rent by getting people to work from home either the whole time or, or half of the time. I mean, I'm personally in favor of sort of two, two days in the office three days at home. So you sort of get some of that socializing without all of the commuting and all of the, the pressure. Um, but someone who will lose out because of this is Jeremy Hunt. Uh, because yes, he is something he did not mention in that Sky interview, a commercial landlord. Um, I saw this mentioned on Twitter today. I had to fact check it. So I went to the register of interests. You can see the incomes of all parliamentarians. Um, and this was on Jeremy Hunt's. So a land and property portfolio value over 100,000 and or giving rental income of over 10,000 pounds a year. So on there, he's got half a share of a holiday home in Italy. He's also got seven apartments in Southampton, but in the middle there, half share of an office building in London. So this man is a commercial landlord. And you might say half share of an office, is that that big a deal? Now let's look at what, what this office is and also how it came about because it tells you something about the man, Jeremy Hunt. Again, uh, so the office is it's a big office in Hammersmith. It was, and potentially still is, I'm not sure, occupied by Hot Courses. That's the company that Jeremy Hunt created. He was co-director, co-founder of that. Now, the, the, the way that this building came to be in the ownership of, of Jeremy Hunt and his co-director was that it was paid to them in dividends. So the company, instead of paying out money uh, in cash in dividends to its co-founders paid out this property and then what happened after that is that hunt rents back the property to hot courses his company at the time and they did this according to the telegraph to avoid tax um, so this scheme the kind of thing that ordinary people don't do you don't transfer someone a a, a, a building to then rent it back yourself this is the kind of thing that, that only the one percent do um, it saved Hunt and his colleague £100,000 each, according to The Telegraph. But that is not enough to keep the man happy. He seemingly wants people to risk their lives, their health, um, so that he can keep making money on his Hammersmith office block. Uh -huh.